My name is Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, and today I'm going to talk to you about photobleaching and photoactivation as tools for examining protein dynamics within cells. Starting with photobleaching and ending with photoactivation, we will discuss how these, uh, pro uh, these uh, different techniques for imaging fluorescent proteins within cells can give us new insights into how molecules behave within side living cells. Now, in the case of photobleaching, all fluorophores that uh, um, absorb and emit fluorescence are able to undergo this type of uh, photo switching uh, capability. Um, this is just an example here of um, dye labeled microtubules that, in response to just uh, 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 onset of uh, light undergo bleaching. Now this is the raw images of these uh, dye labeled uh, microtubules and you can see how the fluorescence diminishes with time. In this panel right here, which is essentially uh, individual frames that are subtracted from each other, you can see how individual molecules uh, undergo this bleaching. And each one of these uh, bright dots here is an inverted image of an individual fluorescent protein that's undergoing uh, photo bleaching uh, as in response to this light exposure. Now, photo bleaching is a property of the fluorophore where it undergoes permanent um, loss of fluorescence capability. And this is due to photon-induced uh, chemical, uh, cross, uh, chemical um, uh, inactivation or covalent modification of the protein that makes it no longer able to absorb and emit uh, fluorescence. Now, researchers have long uh, realized the capability of this technique because one characteristic of photobleaching is that the brighter the um, light that you expose your specimen to, the, uh, quick, the more rapidly the fluorophores undergo photobleaching. And this is illustrated in this experiment here where GFP-tagged ER transmembrane uh, protein uh, is uh, being exposed to confocal light um, of, one way, uh, of one intensity. And then, shortly thereafter, a small region of interest is exposed to very bright um, uh, intensity uh, light, which leads to the permanent inactivation of all the fluorophores in that region of interest. Now, what researchers have realized is that by continuing imaging uh, this specimen over time with the low-light irradiation, the bleached and the non-bleached molecules can undergo, fluores uh, undergo exchange uh, with each other in the uh, membranes uh, where they're residing. And this process is called fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. And it involves the lateral diffusion of these proteins within this uh, membrane environment. Now, this type of selective photobleaching of discrete um, regions of the cell can be really applied to pretty much any site within the cell. Here is the Golgi apparatus where uh, a GFP tag Golgi protein has been expressed. And what you can see is that with bright uh, light exposure to this particular region um, within the, uh, uh, the boxed area, after uh, photobleaching, if one images with low light uh, radiation, you can see uh, exchange of bleached and non-bleached uh, molecules leading to uh, the ultimate recovery of fluorescence within the boxed region. Now, not all fluorescent proteins that are expressed within cells in every environment will undergo this type of exchange as a result of the dynamic motion of these proteins. In this case, uh, one's looking, one, looks, uh, one can look at the distribution of uh, a molecule, lamin B receptor, either in the nuclear envelope or in the endoplasmic reticulum. And when we photobleach uh, particular regions of either the, the nuclear envelope or the ER, you can see very different recovery kinetics of this molecule in these two different compartments. In the case of the ER, there's rapid lateral diffusion of this lamin B receptor into the region that has been uh, photobleached with the bleached molecules moving out and the non-bleached molecules moving back in. In the case of the nuclear envelope, however, the lamin B receptor has uh, become anchored 
to uh, uh, these uh, membranes, presumably because of interactions with nuclear envelope components like laminates. And as a result, there's very little exchange of the bleached and non-bleached pool, pools. Now, quantifying the information that one gets from these experiments uh, really opens up a whole toolbox uh, of capabilities for getting insight into uh, the inherent dynamics of these proteins. Um, typically, what one, is, uh, one does in this technique called fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, or FRAP, is to uh, plot as a function of time the recovery kinetics of fluorescence within the bleached uh, regions of interest. In this case, you've got the bleached air, and then with time, you see recovery. And if one uh, measures the uh, kinetics of that process, you can see that it, it, it has a, a, a clear signature um, that turns out to be different depending on the physical chemical characteristics of the protein of interest. In the case of uh, proteins freely diffusing within a membrane or a cytoplasm, uh, recovery is uh, typically 100%. Um, and the diffusion coefficient, which can be estimated from the halftime of the recovery kinetics, is characteristic of the protein um, and can be determined uh, based on this simple equation right here, uh, where uh, the diffusion coefficient for a spot bleach is equivalent to um, the uh, uh, radius of the bleached uh, area squared divided by four times the half time, the half life for this recovery kinetic, kinetics. Now, oftentimes, as I showed in the last example with the nuclear envelope protein, a pool of these molecules does not completely recover, and that pool we call the immobile fraction. That's the percentage of the molecules that are not recovering over the time course of the experiment and represent molecules that, for some reason or other, cannot diffuse uh, within the cellular environment. Here are measured diffusion coefficients for the green fluorescent protein. What you can see is that there is over a hundredfold difference in the diffusion coefficient of this molecule, depending on whether it's localized in water, cytoplasm, ER lumen, or integrated into the membrane bilayer. So what are the properties that can affect a protein's diffusion in different environments? And here I've listed uh, uh, properties that in particular affect membrane proteins that are diffusing laterally across a uh, lipid bilayer. And in the case of uh, these, uh, trans these uh, uh, membrane proteins, what we found is that these molecules can either go uh, free, they can freely diffuse within the lipid environment. They, they can be completely immobilized, as we saw for the nuclear envelope protein. Um, and another uh, feature that frequently causes immobilization of proteins in the bilayer is their interaction with cytoskeletal elements like actin um, or uh, microtubules, which uh, essentially prevent these molecules uh, from freely diffusing. What will slow down the diffusion coefficient of a protein is when it's assembled uh, with other proteins. This makes the molecule much larger, and hence it moves more slowly. This um, has a uh, very clear-cut signature for soluble proteins, uh, where um, as you um, essentially as you increase the size of that soluble protein, there's a direct uh, correlation with the impact on the diffusion coefficient. And the same is true uh, in the lipid bilayer. And finally, these molecules can undergo a type of confinement where they can bop around in a particular lipid environment within the cell, uh, but unable to diffuse outside of that environment due to uh, protein cages that might surround uh, these molecules. Now here's an example um, where uh, different plasma membrane proteins uh, have been compared in terms of their, their uh, dy dynamism within the membrane uh, of the cell surface. And uh, what I want to emphasize here is that simply the mode of insertion or association or attachment of these proteins with this membrane bilayer has a dramatic effect on its diffusion coefficient, such that the fully transmembrane proteins, 
uh, in this case, HA GFP, LAT GFP, uh, or uh, uh, VSVG um, proteins, their diffusion coefficient is significantly um, uh, slower than the lipid anchored proteins uh, that uh, essentially just are on the outer or inner leaflet of the uh, plasma membrane. Um, and that, because they have less viscosity, less drag on them as they undergo their Brownian motion, uh, they can diffuse more quickly across the plasma membrane. So I've talked to you about how FRAP measurements have provided insight into diffusion of fluorescent proteins through the cytosol or within membrane bilayers. But it's also possible to use photobleaching to look at the uh, extent to which uh, vesicles can move um, between different compartments within cells and the binding and release kinetics of molecules with particular um, surfaces or substrates. And I just want to show you a couple examples of this. So here's an example where photobleaching um, has uh, enabled the visualization of transport intermediates that are budding off of this organelle here that we call the Golgi apparatus. All of these little structures that you see moving outside, um, away from this central region here represent transport intermediates carrying this VSVG protein en route uh, to the plasma membrane. These small vesicles would normally be very difficult to see uh, in the background of the plasma membrane. But by photobleaching everything outside the Golgi region of interest, uh, you create a dark background, which makes it very easy to, the, to see these transport intermediates and uh, uh, characterize uh, their properties. Here's another example where we're photobleaching um, selected regions of a cell expressing a GPI-anchored protein that its steady state is found in the Golgi as well as the plasma membrane. Now what you're going to see in this experiment is selective photobleaching of the regions of interest enclosed by these, by this, uh, red, uh, these red lines. And what you can see in the, uh, this experiment is after photobleaching, those regions become dark. But due to exchange between the plasma membrane and this uh, Golgi region of interest, we see recovery uh, within this region of interest. Now, you don't see any recovery in this region of interest because, in this case, we photobleach the entire cell. And because these cells are, are treated with a protein synthesis inhibitor, cyclohexamide, there's no new protein synthesis and so no way for any fluorescence to return in this experiment. After all, after photobleaching, these fluorophores are permanently um, unable to exhibit uh, fluorescence emission. Now, in the case of this recovery that we're seeing here, we can go in and actually quantify the kinetics of this recovery, as shown in this graph down here, and from that, get insight into the, the kinetics of movement of vesicles that convey the GPI-anchored protein from the cell surface to the Golgi apparatus. And that's illustrated in this little diagram right here, where based on the initial fluorescent intensities associated with the, with the, the Golgi and the plasma membrane, we were, uh, and combined with this kinetic recovery uh, curve, we were able to determine rate constants for movement of these molecules between the plasma membrane and Golgi, revealing a continuous cycling pathway of these GPI-anchored proteins between the plasma membrane and Golgi apparatus. FRAP recovery can also reveal insight into the binding and release cycle of proteins that are binding and dissociating from membrane sur surfaces or other protein scaffolds within cells. In this case, uh, what one's looking at is photobleaching of cells expressing the epsilon cop subunit of the codomer or cop1 coat complex. As you can see from this very rapid recovery uh, exchange that you see in this movie here, what this data suggests is that these coat subunits are undergoing continuous, continuous binding and dissociation from these membranes as they engage in vesicle 
uh, budding and uh, release from membranes. So these are just a few examples of just uh, of how you can use uh, photobleaching of expressed fluorescent proteins to get insight into diffusional dynamics and exchange of molecules from one, one place to another within the cell. I now want to just briefly mention another type of photobleaching application that involves analysis of what's happening outside the photobleached area instead of what's inside the photobleached area. So typically, in a FRAP experiment, as shown here, what one, one is monitoring is recovery into the photobleached region of interest. And as shown in this curve here, that typically involves a exchange uh, that can be either diffusion or type of um, directed motion. You can get, you can also get tremendous information about protein dynamics and organization by looking at what happens to the fluorescent molecules outside the photobleached area in this technique called fluorescence loss in photobleaching. And in this technique, in order to uh, get insight into the dynamics of these molecules outside the photobleach region, what one typically does is continuously photobleach over time a particular region of interest and then look at what happens at a particular region outside um, the uh, photobleached area to um, get insight into uh, the way the molecules are positioned and anchored in that region. And here's an example um, where this technique of FLIP uh, has uh, proved quite uh, informative. This is a syncytial fly embryo expressing an actin GFP probe. Now this embryo is quite large, um, many, many uh, microns across, and it's an open system. It's a single cell that has many individual nuclei associated with it. And uh, these nuclei you can see as individual sort of holes here where the actin is distributed all around. What one sees is that with repetitive photobleaching of this region of interest right here, the fluorescence outside uh, this uh, 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 region red box depletes with time. And that is because the actin molecules are very rapidly moving throughout this whole environment. Now what's particularly interesting is when you look at that uh, photobleaching recovery curve, you can see that there's almost like sharp boundaries on either side um, at, at a distance from this uh, photobleaching box, which suggests that there's some inter internal t type of uh, boundary that's operating within this embryo that restricts diffusion to uh, regions that are uh, really very um, uh, close to the photobleached uh, region of interest. And that turns, uh, we think, um, has uh, Im implications for how the embryo is organized into uh, really pre-cellular units um, prior to the ultimate cellularization of this embryo, which occurs after uh, 13 nuclear division cycles. Now, even though FRAP and FLIP can uh, provide all of these really interesting insights into uh, protein dynamics within cells, they do have some limitations. These include the fact that the fluorescent GFP species are being continuously synthesized, synthesized and folded during the course of any photobleaching experiment. So if you're doing a long recovery uh, kinetics, one has to be aware of this, that some of the kinetics may actually uh, be more than just lateral exchange of these proteins with each other, but could be due to actual new protein uh, synthesis uh, that, that brings in new fluorescent species that have never been photobleached. Another um, aspect of this system that one has to be aware of is that photobleaching of GFP um, to highlight specific protein populations, as I showed in some of these examples, uh, can often be slow. It may take many re repeated photobleaching cycles in order to deplete these molecules. And that makes it difficult to get accurate uh, protein dynamic uh, data. Uh, and finally, these techniques are not able to readily allow you to address protein turnover. And so that's led researchers to look at, look for an alternative photodynamic uh, technique, 
that would allow one to address these issues. And that's possible using photo activation. In this technique, a photoactivatable fluorescent protein or dye is expressed within cells and, the, the, and is selectively switched on by photoactivation. So in this experiment, you, don't, um, you start off by having a black uh, uh, invisible pool of fluorescent proteins. And by photoactivation, you switch on a discrete pool. And then you watch the fate of those highlighted molecules over time as illustrated in this graph here. Now, um, this is possible because of the availability of photoactivatable fluorescent proteins as well as photoactivatable uh, dyes. And here's an example of a cell expressing one of these photoactivatable fluorescent proteins tar uh, tagged to a protein that moves through the secretory pathway. And you can see here we can switch on these molecules in the Golgi and you can then watch them move out to the cell uh, surface. The photoactivatable fluorescent proteins, as I mentioned, have this capability of going from being off to on because they are able to sh shift their um, um, uh, 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 absorption spectrum in response to UV light. So the way that you switch on these molecules is by activating them with UV light that changes the absorption spectrum at the imaging wavelength, and now you see a big signal, and the molecules have been switched on. There are many different photoactivatable fluorescent proteins in uh, essentially three different classes, those that switch from being dark to green or red, those that can switch from green to, to uh, red, and those that can switch back and forth. Here's an example of uh, experiment using the, photo, uh, the photoconvertible EOS molecule that switches from uh, green to red in response to UV light. And what we're interested in this particular experiment is looking at the relationship between actin that's found in the lamellopodial region that's undergoing this protrusion retraction cycle and the actin that's down in this bundled region. So in the experiment, you express, in this case, the actin TODD EOS. It's found in all of the actin filaments within the cell. And then we selectively uh, can photoconvert a subset of those molecules, as illustrated here. Um, here is where um, these uh, molecules just before photoconversion, and in this region here, we photoconvert this lamellopodial pool of actin. If you then watch what happens three minutes later, you can see that this pool of molecules now moves down into this uh, region here uh, that's defined by this bundle of actin. So what this is telling us is that uh, these molecules of actin that are assembling at the lamellopodia are actually uh, sur uh, not dis disassembling over time, but in fact, they can uh, subset them of them, remain stable, and create this bundle of actin that's found uh, in the uh, rear of this, uh, in the uh, lamella region of the cell. And this uh, type of analysis um, is really uh, useful in trying, uh, in essentially allowing us to understand the relationship between these two pools of actin that play such an important role in uh, the contractile activity of cells that are crawling. Now, one final uh, application of photoactivation that is uh, really uh, extremely valuable um, is uh, use in quantifying protein turnover. This is a molecule CD3 delta that has been modified with a photoactivatable GFP and expressed within the ER of cells. This is one second after photoactivation where all those molecules have been switched on. And because these molecules can't uh, exit the ER and instead undergo degradation, it's possible to track this degradation in time and, and in effect quantify it as shown here in this uh, graph. This allows one to get insight into the lifetime of these proteins, which just simply tagging a protein with GFP doesn't allow you to do because of the continual synthesis of these molecules over time. So in summary, we have these three different photodynamic techniques that all use uh, fluorescence and fluorescently tagged proteins to get insight into how molecules uh, move within cells uh, and uh, what their fate over time is. With FRAP, one 
eliminates fluorescence by photobleaching and looks at the exchange of the bleached and non-bleached pools. In FLIP, one eliminates a particular region of interest of fluorescence and does so continuously to then watch how, what the effect of that is on fluorescent molecules that are outside that region. And that provides insight into the overall dynamics of, of proteins that are tagged within cells. And finally, with photoactivation, one has the ability to really uh, harness both this, this, uh, these strategies, but in addition, look at protein turnover, because after you photoactivate, um, no new proteins are being uh, uh, visualized, except for the pool that you've uh, highlighted at that moment in time. And so you can track, as in a pulse chase labeling experiment, the fate of these molecules. Thank you.